I'm going to start sweating. I, <laughs> I already am. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Powerhouse Arena's virtual events. We'll let everybody uh, enter the webinar from the waiting room. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Chris, uh, and I'm the events director at Powerhouse. And I'm very excited to finally be hosting a burning pizza affair featuring uh, Mega Majumdar, Jean Kyung Fraser, and Sanai Lamon. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, you'll be able to ask questions through the chat or the Q&A function on your screen uh, throughout the event, and then the authors will take them at the end. You can also buy their books at powerhousebookstores.com. The link is in the event page for all the books, and then I'll also post them in the chat. Uh, the authors will provide book plates if you want a signed book. Uh, oh, we already have a question here for you, Jean. Oh, God. I'm so <laughs> sorry. My friends are very obnoxious. Uh, anyway, uh, so you can buy the books uh, and well, we'll sign, send along book plates and let me introduce the authors before we get, get started. Uh, Megha Majumdar was born and raised in Kolkata, India. She moved to the United States to attend college at Harvard University, followed by graduate school in social anthropology at Johns Hopkins University. She works as an editor at Catapult and lives in New York City. A Burning is her first book. Uh, Sanai Lamont was born to, in Paris to a Japanese mother and French father and raised in France and Australia. She earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania and her MFA at Columbia University. She now lives in New York. Jean Kyung Fraser lives in Los Angeles and is writing for an upcoming TV show. Uh, Pizza Girl is her debut novel and I'll let them take it away. Um, so first, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how, how the event is going to be this evening. We're going to begin by describing our books, telling you a little bit about what they're, um, what they're about, and then reading a couple of pages from them. And then we'll discuss um, different questions and themes that we um, talked about earlier this week and thought would be interesting to all of you. Um, so I'm going to get started first um, and tell you a little bit about my novel, The Margot Affair. Um, the Margot Affair takes place in Paris, and it's the story of 17-year-old Margot, who's the illegitimate daughter of a stage actress and a politician with presidential ambitions. Um, Margot's father has a, a wife and two sons, and he splits his time between both families. The summer before Margot turns 17 and um, before she starts her last year of high school, she meets a journalist and makes the reckless decision to tell him about her father's identity. The novel takes place in the aftermath of that reveal. I'm just gonna read a short passage from the very opening of the book. On stage, my mother was her truest self. I would see the transformation within moments, a slow building intimacy between herself and the audience. Mid scene, she would remove her shirt with the ease of a man, as if taking off a pair of socks. Then she would hold her red curls with both hands and lift them high enough to expose the length of her neck, jut out her elbows and accentuate the slope of her shoulders. She could be whomever she wanted. In her one woman shows, she would address the audience as though they were old friends. I, would, I could feel her effect on them as they tilted forward, eyes wide, their pores opening in her presence. She carried this effortless familiarity out into the world. With strangers, she was joyful and gracious. She dazzled. In other words, she was a true actress. She had been acting since her teenage years, but it was a lead role in the 90s when I was barely five years old that propelled her career and led to her solo acts. The play in question was Mer, a short forceful production that ran 80 minutes without an intermission. It had a small cast, a man, his wife whom she played, their three young children and the man's father. It ended in a long scene where the mother kills her children in a bathtub. 
The potential for such a violent act wasn't at first visible in the mother, although there was a hovering sense of unease interspersed with moments of levity and tenderness. At that age, no one told me my mother was playing a woman who murders her children, but I knew off stage she would often choose to stay in character. At home, she was a stranger to me. I wanted her to return to where she'd come from, as if she could be reabsorbed into herself. She was turned inside out, her interior laid flat along her skin for everyone to see. I preferred her right side out, a mother in the conventional sense. I wanted to be proud of my mother, and yet most of the time I would find myself annoyed. What others admired in her seemed exaggerated and theatrical to me. Well, it is theater, Mathilde said when I complained. But I want to be moved by her. I want to stand on my feet and clap with all of you. What high school girl is moved by her mother? A good one. We love that you're not good, Theo said. Theo and Mathilde were my mother's closest friends. Mathilde was a renowned designer in the theater world, specializing in embroidery. She tailored my clothes and made me dresses for special events. She had worked on the costumes for Mer. Theo, her husband, was a dancer. My mother had trained as a dancer in her youth and felt an instant kinship to Theo. With me, my mother cultivated distance in a more deliberate way. I had memories of standing outside her room, knocking on the door. Maman, I'd say, thinking she hadn't heard me. One day I transitioned to Anouk, hoping she might better respond to her name. Over time, it became harder to say Maman. The soft consonants would belie the estrangement I so often felt around her. Anouk, on the other hand, ended with a sharp edge, and when I yelled her name, it was like throwing her over a cliff. Oh yeah, that was great. Um, I guess I'll read next. <laughs> um, I'm doing my book, Pizza Girl, and it's about a pregnant 18 year old pizza delivery girl who falls into obsession with an older woman that she delivers to. So let's get cracking. I'm just gonna read from the first chapter. Her name was Jenny Hauser and every Wednesday I put pickles on her pizza. The first time she called in, it had been mid-June, the summer of 2011. I'd been at Eddie's a little over a month. My uniform polo was green and orange and scratchy at the pits. People would loudly thank me and then tip me a dollar. At the end of shifts, my hair reeked of garlic. Every hour I thought about quitting, but I was 18, didn't know how to do much of anything, 11 weeks pregnant. At least it got me out of the house. The morning she called, mom hugged me four times, Billy five, all before I'd pulled on my socks and poured milk over my cereal. They hurled I love yous against my back as I fast walked out the front door. Some days I wanted to turn around and hug them back. On others, I wanted to punch them straight in the face, run away to Thailand, Hawaii, Myrtle Beach, somewhere with sun and ocean. That's mine. <laughs> that was great. Um, I am just going to say that I am in the middle of both of these books and <laughs> They are so good. I've been staying up late with them. And um, while well, everybody watching has already heard what they're about, but I'll say really quickly that one thing I'm really struck by in the Margot affair is just the elegance and precision of the language about bodies. There is so much here that is so attentive to the bodily experience of people moving through the world, which I really love. And Pizza Girl, I had heard so much about how it's a really funny book and it is but it's also in really profound ways about grief. And that just took me aback. Like it's so funny, but it's also really in my read about grief. So moving. Um, I'm going to read very briefly from A Burning, um, which is a novel about three people who are chasing big dreams as the society around them makes this dangerous turn toward right-wing nationalism. And I will read just a little bit from the opening. You smell like smoke, my mother said to me. So I rubbed an oval of soap in my hair and poured a whole bucket of water on myself before a neighbor complained that I was wasting the morning supply. There was a curfew that day. On the main street, a police jeep would creep by every half hour daily wage laborers compelled to work 
would come home with arms raised to had no weapons. In bed, my wet hair spread on the pillow. I picked up my new phone, purchased with my own salary, screen guard still attached. On Facebook, there was only one conversation. These terrorists attacked the wrong neighborhood. The night before, I had been at the railway station, no more than a 15 minute walk from my house. I ought to have seen the men who stole up to the open windows and threw flaming torches into the halted train, but all I saw were carriages burning, their doors locked from the outside and dangerously hot. The fire spread to huts bordering the station, smoke filling the chests of those who lived there. More than a hundred people died. The government promised compensation to the families of the dead. 80,000 rupees, which, well, the government promises many things. In a video to the dozen microphones thrust at his chin, the chief minister was saying, let the authorities investigate. Somebody had spliced this comment with a video of policemen scratching their heads. It made me laugh. I admired these strangers on Facebook who said anything they wanted to. They were not afraid of making jokes, whether it was about the police or the ministers. They had their fun. And wasn't that freedom? I'll stop there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not as eloquent as Mega by any means, but her book is super dope and everyone should definitely check it out. I read it. I feel like it was one of those books I was on the couch. And then all of a sudden I looked up and like three hours had gone by just like that. It was wild. So anyway. <laughs> well, what I, what I immediately loved about both of your novels when I read them um, in June is how I was just um, so quickly immersed into the world of the book. I mean, within the first page, and I'm sure everyone heard with those first sentences, it's just like you're plunged so deep into... Um, this fictional space. And I, for both of your books, I read them, um, I think, in maybe two or three days, just in a couple of sittings. Um, and so my the, the first thing that we're going to talk about is opening. So I'm glad that we all read from our first chapters. Um, it's this idea of, of um, did, like, did we always know where what the first chapter would be, what our entryway into this specific story would be? Or is that something that um, came to us as we were working on the book. Um, you know, what, like, what's, what started that first sentence, essentially? I can jump in. Um, I think for a while, the opening of this book, um, so it, it still involves an incident where a train is attacked, but for a while I had this kind of standalone tiny chapter detailing that attack and then I kind of launched into the story, but I worked on it with my brilliant editor Jordan Pavlin and she suggested that I start by diving into one of the characters rather than putting readers through the train incident and then into the character and it was absolutely the right decision. You know, I, I realize now that she was making these really powerful links between the opening and something that happens much later in the book. Mm -hmm. And that's why it absolutely works, I think. Yeah, no, that's like, that's well said. I, um, for me, it's like, I'm a big like first line person. So I had that first line funny enough for like years before I started the book even, you know, cause I was just thinking, I was like, oh, a pizza delivery novel could be like, a really interesting sort of like you know pun not intended like vehicle to like explore a character and explore a world but I was like what would it be about and I was like oh has to be obsessed with a customer and then I was thinking more and more about it and I was like her name was Jenny Hauser and every Wednesday I put pickles on her pizza you know it has that like mystery I like in a first line but also a little humor a little sexy too in some weird way I don't know there was something <laughs> about it and it took me a long time to like write the book just because, you know, sometimes when you just have like, I feel like a sentence or a big plot, it isn't enough to get started. And I feel like a lot more things had to happen to me before I was like ready to write that book. And so I worked on, I had that line for like two years. It was weird to think about. I love that that line um, drew you in, made you curious in a way. Yeah, totally. It productive and it just, and you kept following its trail. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, do, do you do you remember sort of you working on your first one like how it 
how that first chapter came to be? Yeah, it took so long. I think it was um, the first chapter is the last thing I did before uh, we moved into copy edit, which is wild. But um, when I first that started, wild. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, when I first started writing this book, I actually I started with the voice of another character. It took me a while mm -hmm. to get to Margot's perspective, and the entire novel is told from from her point of view in first person. Um, but I was kind of I was circling around her. And, and then when I finally got to her voice, I couldn't decide on the time frame. Um, I had a first chapter that started more in the future, or then that was a flashback. It just kept shifting. And then I took the advice of, a, of one of my teachers, Victor Laval, who um, is, was really changed my life in this book um, in the MFA at Columbia. And he kept telling us, you know, why are you writing such complicated stories? Just tell it the simplest way. Um, and so for me, that was beginning chronologically with Margot and her mother in their home to really set up this um, unusual family dynamic, um, the secret life that they, that they live together. Right. So it took about eight years to get there. <laughs> eight years, gosh. I mean, it shows there's like so much care in the story and just like sort of like I have never been to Paris or anywhere close. But I was like, I could see that shit. I was like, I'm in Paris. I get it. I know it. You know, and that I think that comes from just like supreme confidence and like your setting and your like ability to sort of emulate the setting, even when you're not talking about it, you know, truly. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, so I was thinking a lot too about like, now that we've talked about the beginnings, like, how do you like, how did you know you were at the end of your books? Or did you have that idea like similar to like, once you knew the beginning, you're like, okay, the natural conclusion is this, or did it change several times? I, I don't know, I think about that a lot. Can I read something? I can start again. Um, <laughs> so I think the ending was, I knew the kind of shape of the story that I wanted, but I didn't quite know where would be a good place to leave these characters that felt narratively satisfying but not artificially tidy and this was one of the big structural things that um um gene you and i share um a brilliant literary agent eric we simonoff do. and eric and i were big rick <laughs> 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 Eric and I worked um, really hard and really thoughtfully on where is a good place to leave these characters and how might we end. Um, and I think I ended up writing kind of longer arcs for a couple of the characters than remains in the book, which I'm really glad that I did because I have this vision of how their lives have continued, but that's not in the book, which I think is really fun. Yeah, yeah, totally. I'm, I'm dying to have that conversation with you um, after, because I don't want to reveal the plot, but where, <laughs> what, what lives the characters have continued to live. Yes, um, thank uh, God you know. I'm also curious. <laughs> <laughs> um, I changed the ending so many times. I just, <laughs> I really doubted myself there. I mean, the, the opening and the ending were, were by far the, the hardest parts. Um, but I think ultimately, because there is a coming of age element to this novel, I really wanted um, us to see that Margot has undergone a transformation of some kind. And I wanted the reader to feel that by the end, she has landed in a different place um, and that her understanding of the world and, and her family has somehow changed. Um, and I remembered a piece of advice um, that, that another teacher told me, which was that some of her favorite endings are echoes of a previous scene that she's read. Oh, um, sure. So there's that moment when, so when the reader encounters the ending, there's that moment of recognition and um, also inevitability. And I thought that, that was so inspiring. I didn't quite know how it would apply to my book, but I held on to that idea of how the ending could be an echo of an earlier scene, but with variation. Mm -hmm. And I hope that's what, what I achieved. Um, <laughs> you have to see if you read. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. That's like, that's kind of, I, man, I, it's so weird. It's or not weird. Okay. How much, what am I trying to say? My tongue is like, well, um, <laughs> go for it. Yeah. It's like those things you're saying, you realize you're 
thinking certain things without even knowing like actively you're thinking it which is why it's always so fun to talk to two writers and like understand like their process because they can give you like names for things um because when i was writing too it's like i i'm kind of like a flashlight writer if that makes sense i don't like jumping ahead too much chronologically like because i get too stressed and it bothers me too much to have like untied ends and whatnot but i was thinking i was like how do i like you said mega give a ending that is realistic and also satisfying though for the character um and so when i was writing mine like a big part of the book is basically it's like it is a coming of age but kind of like anti coming of age and that like i feel like rarely does someone have like one moment and then they're completely different afterwards it's like a moment can change you but it takes sometimes a while for that change i think to manifest mm -hmm. so i was mostly thinking when i was getting to that end i was like how do i write an ending that is realistic but still hopeful and so that was sort of my process the whole time um yeah Mm -hmm. That's so fascinating because I wonder if some readers have been really excited by that and been like, yes, I recognize myself in that and others have totally. been created and, you know, I want, you know, I want like the, the tidier kind of resolution, which is not life anyway. No, but, totally. I mean, I'm sure my book pissed plenty of people off <laughs> with the ending, but, you know, it, it felt at least to me like the only logical way to do it. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I don't know. Fun way to get to it. Yeah. Um, switching gears a tiny bit, um, I know that we've all published our first books in this really strange and difficult season. Let's talk about how this experience has been or how the broader experience of publishing leading up to this launch has been, whichever you prefer to talk about. So now you first, gosh. Um, <laughs> I mean, gosh, I, I feel like we could talk about this for hours, um, but I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, I think the, the main thing for me leading up to publication, right around publication, um, which was in June, uh, is that it was, it was a lot harder to focus on the book, and it felt yeah. quite jarring to go from the world of the book, which is so contained, and the novel takes place in Paris, and the character is a 17-year-old girl, um, to move between that world and then what we were moving through here and living, it just, um, it, 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 it was like a constant readjustment. Um, and, and then the other thing is that it, it didn't, and, and I don't have anything to compare to, maybe it feels this way for other W writers when, you know, you published a year ago or two years ago, but um, it didn't really feel quite real until friends started sending me photos of um, the book in bookstores. The first one that I received was from California because the bookstore there was open before the East Coast. Um, and then I didn't see my novel in a bookstore uh, until a few weeks after publication. And I was in DC and I, I went to politics and prose. Um, and I am so shy. This was really painful, but I think the mask helps. And I walked up to the bookseller and introduced myself like mortified saying, <laughs> just published my first novel and I see that you carry it and like I don't know if you usually have your author sign books I mean it's fine if you don't but if you do I I would love to sign the book <laughs> and the bookseller was so gracious he was so wonderful and um and he congratulated me and it just felt like a really it was awkward but also it was so it was so special um and you know he they made like a whole thing out of me signing three copies and it felt like a mini celebration. And I think that that was, um, that was, that felt like, okay, now this, this object is out in the world. Um, and oh, yeah, so, yeah. I, I know there haven't been that many moments of celebration. So that felt like, like something I'm going to hold on to for now. Hell yeah. It's a huge fucking moment. It really is. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing it's like what I've been trying to focus on like all the stuff that is like is the same and would have been the same regardless if book the book was published in a normal time and one of those things really has been like the joy of seeing people just like interact with my book and like send me messages about my book I've had so many friends text me being like I read your book here I read your book there it made me think of this it made me think of that and it's just always a good reminder of like oh yeah this is why I'm a writer you know I don't write for any other reason than to just like disconnect with people like that so yeah I don't know I, I of course I'm still figuring out how I feel about everything too it's like all our books have been out like what a month now 
Yeah. That's crazy to me. Gosh, it's this day that you just wait for for so long. Um, if, you know, like if people don't realize, it's like all of us probably sold our book like a year, a year and a half ago. I've had two birthdays since I sold my book. <laughs> I'm old as hell. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I don't know. I really like these reminders to celebrate in small ways, like really mark yeah. your book and find a moment of celebration in someone texting you or in like yeah. coming across a picture of your book on social media. I really agree that those mm -hmm. small moments of celebration have been so meaningful, I think, especially mm -hmm. now. I still have not seen my book in a bookstore. Um, and it has, it has felt like a really hard time to to celebrate anything, you know, just yeah. kind of reading the horrifying things in the news and just mm -hmm. keeping in mind that um, people are grappling with, you know, being sick or having loved ones who are sick and having lost right. jobs and all that kind of thing. So just trying to hold both of those things, I think that you can feel that and, and do what you can to help out in this moment. And it's okay if you come across a picture of your book on social media and you take a second to be like, wow, my book reached someone that I personally don't know, but like they get to be with my book and hopefully it brings them something. Oh yeah. Yeah. I got the most beautiful message the other day. I learned how to check my DMs properly on something <laughs> and, I, and I checked and this woman messaged me saying that how much my book provided comfort for her and that she's like immunocompromised and disabled and she hasn't left her apartment in like months and that just wrecked me it was it was cool as hell i mean really really fucking moving you know but anyway well mega i've seen your book in in a couple of places actually i've seen our three books together and it always warms Aww. my heart i feel like <laughs> form a little team and <laughs> you know it's so nice to a burning to pizza affair you know <laughs> just taking over the world mm-hmm um, so to, to continue talking about this publishing process, um, I'm curious, is there anything that you would have liked to know before you embarked on publishing uh, your novel? I can go first. I'm um, so sorry. Then... I'm making you do all the no, no, questions no. before me. <laughs> <laughs> um... I think the, the thing that comes to mind for me is, uh, so I work in publishing as well. I work as an editor at Catapult. And I think for me, the process provided affirmation of something that I already knew, which is that so, so many people work on a book. Um, mm. And it's really yeah. astounding the number of people who have to come together and come together with with care and generosity and real feeling for your book to yeah. lift it up. I mean, I think some of the most visible roles are perhaps, you know, your, your editor and your agent, but, you know, you have um, publicists. I have been lucky enough to work with an incredible publicist, Gabrielle Brooks, who has really championed this book and people in marketing and sales reps and people at bookstores who recommend your book if somebody's mm. asking them for a rec and, um, you know, people on Bookstagram and you just realize how many people lift up a book at all different stages of its life. Yeah. And it is such a team effort. And so I'm always, I'm really moved by just the thoughtfulness of that work. I think it is something that I will always be grateful for is that people lifted up a book. Yeah, truly, yeah. I think that blew me away at first too, where I was just like, damn, I was like, I didn't like, even before the book came out, like a month after selling, I was like, whoa, so many more people have read it than I ever thought <laughs> and are working hard for me. And like doing, they do, like people doing work for you that you don't see and will never truly know. Like, cause it's like, they're talking about your book constantly. And that's very, very generous and cool. Um, I feel like other things I would have liked to know, I guess it's like, it's like a basic one, but like, you know, t being ready, like emotionally to like sort of put yourself out in the world. Like, cause even again, if the book isn't autobiographical, it's, it's fiction, but stuff is personal, you know, and you have to be ready for that stuff to not belong to you anymore. Like for people to like read your work and they're not thinking about you. And that's, that's, it's, it's scary, but it's also really cool, again, to just think about how your work influences people and like sort of what they take from your work, stuff that you might have never even imagined, you know, so. 
I think I'm still working through that. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tough. That one, uh, yeah. Um, I, when I think about the entire process, it, it took several years and, and yet it actually went by quite quickly. And so yeah. um, maybe what I would tell my younger self is, you know, it'll, it might take a long time, but it, it won't necessarily feel that way. Um, and I, this is another thing I've been thinking about, which sort of re relates to what we were talking about earlier, but mm -hmm. to take a moment to um, celebrate uh, whenever something good happens. I don't mean just the publication process, but you know, whether it's you finished a draft or signed with an agent or um, published a, a small essay, whatever it is. Um, I think for me, because I spend so much time at my desk, it's really easy to just continue sitting at my desk <laughs> when something good happens. Like, <laughs> oh, there's a good review and I'll just sit here and read it and then like move on to the next thing. But um, I'm trying to be better about um, actually pausing and thinking, oh, maybe this would be a good time to open a bottle of champagne or, you know, Always or just a good time. leave my desk <laughs> and go eat something delicious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are so few opportunities in the long process of writing a novel and in the writing life to just like enjoy and, and break your routine that, um, yeah, it's, you know, you don't have to, but I found it useful. And yeah. to do the same with writer friends force them to you know enjoy those moments yeah that's nice i dig that that is actually a question i wanted to ask though when you guys do you have a writing routine but more importantly do you guys snack do you snack when you write i don't know <laughs> um i my routine so because i have a full-time job i try to get a little bit of writing done before work starts every day mm -hmm. Um, before, you know, my, my mind is taken over by, by deadlines and emails and things to be done. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of my, my little bit of clean time. And I really try to protect it. Some days I let email invade it and it's a bad decision. Um, <laughs> and I regret it. So, so I really try to safeguard that little bit of time and snacks well in the morning i really love making myself some milky tea i'm such a big fan Ooh, of sweet tea. milky black tea mm. i just got a tingle <laughs> <Nice. laughs> <laughs> sounds so good well, yeah your instagram is very has good food on it for sure good food vibes thank you jean yeah. books and food <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um yeah, I, I wrote most of my novel in the early mornings before going to work. And that's that's just my best time in general to write. Though sometimes I surprise myself by writing late. Um, but by late, I mean 7 p.m. So it's actually not that late. Um, I am always thinking about food and snacks. And maybe that's why you end up seeing so much food in my writing um, <laughs> is an obsession. And on the one hand, it's it's like a form of procrastination because my desk is right next to the kitchen or sometimes in the kitchen. Um, but it's also a, uh, an inspiration um, mm. because when, when I'm preparing a snack or, or cooking something, that's when I'm most relaxed. But um, this afternoon it was just dark chocolate and I was, I was eating so I like the bitter. I like the bitter. I had a headache and I was like, oh, you know what? I just, I'm not going to take Tylenol. I'm just going to eat some chocolate. And I felt immediately better. It was like magic. <laughs> it's really, I hope my mom's not listening to this. <laughs> Less sugar. Mm -hmm. Otherwise my hair will fall out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm more of a salt tooth than a sweet tooth. I always like something salty. Um, pizza? <laughs> no pizza for a while. The belly is quite ill um but i love a good hot pocket I, I love to walk and eat like multitask so it's like i can put a little sleeve eat it as i go throw it away it's all good and uh yeah i don't have a writing routine so my my answer is very very short still working on finding one that works for me i think you know you know but i also think you know if you recognize that you don't have a set rhythm every day that's fine but, I, mean, I yes. remember early on hearing especially in the mfa like oh you know i wake up at 4 a.m and i write for x amount of hours or right. i always write at night or i write every right. single day i right. mean like you just have to get it done 
Totally. You know, I think I like think about my whatever I'm working on every day for sure. And I'll even like look at the word document every day. But, you know, um, I'm up early all the time, too. I'm just like an early riser. My friends think it's hilarious. I, I'm up at like 5 a.m. every day. What? It's so lonely in the mornings. I have no one to talk to. <laughs> you can text me. Time. Great. Perfect. <laughs> Did Mega freeze? I think she did. Oh no. <laughs> a great, it froze on a perfect image of her though. What a great smile. smile. How <laughs> do we help her? I guess we can talk while she figures it out, while she's smiling encouragingly at us. Um, I guess, well, yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, you're back. Oh, you're back. Did I freeze for a minute? You did, you froze for a full minute. You oh, looked no. very happy though, it was like this. <laughs> Perfect moment to freeze. Good. At least there's that. Um, I I was going to ask, how did you know that your book was ready to send out, whether to you know agent yeah. or after that to your editors? How did you know it's ready? God, I have a goofy one with that. I finished my novel one evening at like three a.m. and I looked at it and I was like, this thing is done. I'm fucking done. And my roommate came back, my roommate Evan, shout out Evan. He uh, came back and I was like, dude, I finished my novel. And he's like, dude, that's so cool. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay, good night. It's 3 a.m. And so he went to bed and I poured myself like this celebration drink. But like the minute I hit the bed, I just like knocked out. And when I woke up the next day, there was a dead fly in my, like my drink glass. And it felt like such a bad omen. I was like, no, <laughs> it's like, everything's terrible. <laughs> but like, I just was like looking at my book three hours later that day. And I was like, fuck it, let's do it. You know, I, cause any more tinkering, I think I would have like, I don't know if I would have made it, I might've made it worse. I don't know. Who knows? It's hard to say, but yeah, I looked up agents who repped people I liked and I sent out that day and Eric was the first to respond, funny enough, and now, now he is my agent. Great guy. <laughs> so. Oh, that's such, that's such a nice story. It's so different from mine. <laughs> but I love that. I know. I'm, my story's outrageous. I, I think that's great. I mean, the, there are so many different ways to find an agent and to go through this process, but um, yeah. I did two rounds of querying. And I think the first time was maybe too early. I thought I was done because I had a full draft. I thought, okay, there's a beginning, wow. middle, end. There's a book. Um, but um, what ended up happening is I took all the very generous feedback from the rejections and um, used that to revise the book and for another year, year and a half. Um, and at that point, I felt like I'd done everything I could on my own. I knew that the book still needed more work. It wasn't... Wow there but I I didn't know what that was and I was kind of going around in circles um, and I was hoping to find an agent who could really be my partner and edit with me and help me crack um, the book and I did find someone like that who worked so hard um, for almost two years just That's like awesome. editing the structure and I mean I don't think she knew what she was getting into <laughs> that, but she really the the book would not be what it is today if it if it weren't for her. So paid off, you know, it paid off. Yeah, yeah, no, that was. And then at some point, I, I just I really blindly trusted her. And at some point, she said, um, "I think it's ready. It's a book." She said, "I'm reading it, and it actually reads like a book." <laughs> and so, um, and that's when she sent it out to editors. Um, but it's. I think there was that moment of wow, I wasn't expecting us to ever get there, and then we finally did. Um, and it's, you know, you've often been working years towards this and, and kind of on your own and no one else has read it maybe or very few people and, and then it just leaves the safety of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just out there being read by editors. Um, I think what I found really helpful was the first time that I thought the book was ready I put it down, I think for three weeks or a month. And mm -hmm. then I came back to it and I was like, this is not ready. And then I worked <laughs> on it some more. And then this, the second time that I thought it was ready, put it down again, came back to it after a month. I was like, whoa, there's so much work left to be done. So then I did it. And then I think the third time that I thought it was ready, it felt like it was ready. But of course, then mm -hmm. I did more work with um, Eric and then with Jordan. 
up the book to read from it, there are still sentences that I want to cut or tweak <laughs> or work with. So it really doesn't feel like it's ever oh, ready, ready. It's like I told you, I can't, it. yeah, I can't <laughs> even look at my book. I know I'd, or I'd take a red pen and just like cut so many things up. I think you just, yeah, you, it's, it's, I have um, a, a very wise friend who said, you know, it's just, it's the best book that you've written at this point in your life. <laughs> and it, you could continue to rewrite the same book what? year after year. So true. Very true. Gosh. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I have a question that's a little more personal. Have you shared your novel with your family? And if you have, at what stage did you share it? And mm. what was their response? Uh, I, I shared with my mom and my brother at the same time and I didn't show it to them until there was like a physical copy like a galley I, not the hardcover but the galley I took them out to dinner and I gave them both a book and then when I went to the bathroom and came back my mom was trying to sell the book to our waiter <laughs> which was really <laughs> funny she was she was like yeah for the low low price of 29.95 and I was like I think the book's like 24.95 and she's like shut up <laughs> and it's a galley <laughs> I know it's so funny I was like mom don't you want to read it she's like you'll give me another one um but no she she read it in like a day and my mom doesn't read much so that was like very moving to me and uh she took it a lot cooler than I thought she would I don't know you worry about stuff like that no. yeah it's so it's so strangely intimate to let your family read the thing that you've yeah. been working on for so long totally. um I shared it with my parents when I had uh, a full draft and I felt that the book had legs um, and I really wanted to see, I mean, I, I grew up in India, but of course I, I left when I was 19 mm -hmm. and uh, my parents still live there. And I really wanted to give it to trusted readers who would be able to see if the details and textures yeah. and humor rang true for them, you know, mm. in India for decades. Yeah. It was nerve wracking. <laughs> and did they react? Like, did you, did you like the way they reacted? Like, how were, how were they? Yeah, did they read much I, of your work before? They have read um, a little bit of my work before, but it was always, you know, little short stories here and there, nothing, nothing huge. Um, sure, yeah. They have always been so encouraging and so supportive. So, you know, they told me they were really proud of me and they loved oh. it. And, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Did they have um, any feedback, um, things that they wanted you to change or add or not so much? It's funny because my dad had a lot of copy editing feedback, <laughs> like grammar and spelling and typos. And I was like, you don't have to look at that now. <laughs> it's like, don't worry. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Snai, how was your yeah. family reaction? That's actually one of the reasons why I waited until um, there was a a finished hardcover book. Um, I was I was really nervous to share it with my parents, yeah. especially my mom because she has such high standards and um, she's a smart reader and mm. and much of this novel was written from a personal place and I knew that she'd be very honest and she would tell me what she thought. She can't <laughs> like she's not the kind of person to say bravo or I love this or this is wonderful unless she really means it. Right. Um, so, and I didn't want her to get hung up on typos and, or, you know, um, other small details. So I waited until there was a hardcover book and then, um, I knew she was reading and I think I held my breath for those two weeks and, um, I was, I was pretty nervous and then she told me that she'd finished it and that she'd loved it and that just felt like the greatest compliment, um, yeah, I was, it was a combination of relief and also just, um, I was so glad that we could share that. Um, and then my father read it a little bit before her. Um, but I think what, what, was, what was most interesting is just they, they both read the book so carefully with, with a lot of care and it was moving to hear their responses. And we had, we had a few difficult conversations after they'd read the book, but also um, I do feel as though it's, it's brought us closer or perhaps like we wouldn't have had those conversations maybe ever. Um, oh so yeah, it's been a nice surprise. Um, 
we'll see, okay. we'll see what I'll do with the next one <laughs> until the last hour. Wait for next one. Okay, that's a good question. Second books. Are you guys doing that? <laughs> Or just are we never going to hear from you again? <laughs> um, I'm working very slowly on a second novel, which is very, very different from a burning. Cool. Now are you working so on I'm furious. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bother you like every month. How's the second book coming? I I'll, I'll feel more like your agent than your agent. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm also in the early stages of a second book. I, I had been working on it before March and then I, um, right. took a break. Um, but it, it also feels quite different from my first book, which I'm excited right. for, um, in terms of the scope and the setting right. it's set in Argentina and Japan and the characters are, are in their thirties and forties. Um, no. But, you know, I was thinking about it some more, and there's actually a lot of overlap in terms of themes, and I just, mm. I love complicated family stories, so I'm probably always going to gravitate towards that, and that's... Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Check back in eight years, and we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Okay, okay, agent isn't listening. <laughs> but, yeah. What I'll also yours? check in on you. Yeah. What about mine? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I was, I'm working on two at once, which is like weird, but I think it's because I haven't like made a commitment yet to either of them fully, you know, and a big part of that is one of them has another like 18 year old narrator. And I really want to do the story, but a part of me is like, oh, I just did that. And I don't think I, I've said like everything I want to say about that. So I might just do my other novel, which is a stoner tragedy, simply because, you know, it's about characters more my age, like late 20s. Um, mid twenties, if I'm feeling generous for myself. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll see. It's exciting though. It's nice getting like headspace back and like working on something again, you know, because like it's hard to not think about your first novel for all the stuff leading up to it. Yeah. So no. Hmm. Um, okay, I think we have we've come to our final question mm. before we open it up for um, audience questions. So please, yeah. everybody watching, if you have questions that you have in mind pop them into the q a space. Yeah, we'll do a couple yeah. yeah and the one okay so the last one that we have is what do you do when you're not writing what are other art forms that you enjoy um i feel like i'm a broken record but i just i'm cooking and <laughs> i i really I wish I could cook a meal for, for you both one day. Um, oh, I wish that. God, I'm too many hot pockets. Sorry, continue. <laughs> I'll try to make a hot pocket. Um, but yeah, I, I think just being able to, to stand on my feet and touch ingredients and, yeah. you know, so much of writing is abstract. It's a lot of daydreaming and thinking about characters. So to yeah. be able to um, do something that's very concrete. And I think that's why I love to bake as well, because mm. there's this sort of magical transformation that happens in the oven and then the thing is done and you know you can eat it um it's oh, yeah. it's always really satisfying to see that result absolutely yeah i i do a lot of so when i'm not writing i feel like i i love playing pickup basketball whenever i can or just doing anything active you know and i think it's probably because i just have so much nervous energy it's a good way to get it out and with writing, I have to be still. Mm -hmm. I've tried writing and walking, doesn't work. So, <laughs> you know, it's like in my non-writing hours, it's definitely nice to be like doing something active and everything. I also like sweating when I mean to sweat. Like I don't like sweating like I'm sweating now whenever I talk about my book, <laughs> but it's fun to sweat when you want to sweat. So, how about you, Mega? Um, I have also been cooking a lot and I really love, like you were saying, Sana, the just, you're doing something so specific, you have to focus on that. And then at the end of it, you hopefully have a delicious meal. And recently I have been watching cooking shows <laughs> while cooking, Hell which yeah. is like, <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching this really fun show called Nadia's Time to Eat. It's on Netflix. Have you been watching Cute. it? 
No, but I'm going to. I'll write it down. It sounds great. It's so much fun. It's uh, hosted by this British chef. And Mm. her whole thing is how do busy people make time to cook? So she's all about shortcuts and being very real with busy people. And every episode, she focuses on an ingredient and then like researches that ingredient. It's really fun. I like it. I love that. God, that's awesome. Huh. I watch Nailed It sometimes. That's a funny one. What is that? Oh my, look this up later. It is so great. (laughs) Literally, it's just, they get a bunch of amateur bakers and they try, and they try to create this really intense cupcake or whatever it is. And they, (laughs) the fails are so great. It's hilarious. It's a real feel good. (laughs) Highly recommend. (laughs) I'll have to look it up. Mm Right. Yeah. (laughs) All right, should we do a couple questions before we let everyone get on their way? Yeah, let's do it. Um, I don't know how to check if you guys want to check. There's a question about book covers, actually. Um, And so, all right. um, Can you please talk about your respective book covers, design, conception, options? What Mm -hmm. were some options that you rejected? Why I especially love Pizza Girl. I do too. Maybe we should start with that one. Yeah, we're going. <laughs> um, yeah, it, God, it's, it actually is a very fun story. I, my editor asked me what book covers I liked. Oh, this is a, just an example or like a great advice to people who are having a book coming out soon. Know what covers you like, start noting them because they will ask your input and it's nice to have something to say. And so I sent a couple that I liked, but I also have this t-shirt from this pizza shop in Brooklyn, Roberta's. And I was like, damn, this shirt's really cool. Should I send it to her? And I was like, yeah, fuck it, I'll send it to her. <laughs> cute um so i sent her my t-shirt and a week later she contacts me and she's like me and the art department can't get that shirt out of our heads so we tracked down the artist tall boy he's great check him out and we asked him to do your book cover and, and he was down it was really it was really uh, just a fun uh, unexpected story and everything uh i think i have an option here of what the cover was going to look like before it was like he got the design from the beginning and the only thing that changed was just the color scheme of it and my phone is frozen classic <laughs> but it was basically more goosebumpy blue and green and it still looked really cool too but we mm. went with the brighter color scheme at the end and I think it really I just I mean it's a dream cover I really really feel lucky can we get can we so get gorgeous with the t-shirts yes. oh god I should do that yeah. fine. Yes. I'll, I'll send a google doc out to people if they'd even the want merch it. opportunities Jean. <laughs> a tote bag at least <laughs> you know. or a bag yes yeah <laughs> how about you guys with your covers I mean both of them are pretty stunning too all three of these wow um a burning this was actually the first they showed me and i loved Mm. it um i just thought it was perfect i was really happy that they snuck the train onto the cover yes Um, perfect too which means so much to me so it's designed by this brilliant artist called tyler comrie Mm. cool right on um I, and it it also it just has such a nice um, texture and feel to it. I don't know what you have to rub it against your cheek. Do a little cheek feel. <laughs> it's just like yeah, the, the feel. aspect. I really, I really love um, this cover. Um, I think that was really good advice, Jean, of to to yeah. know what you like, um, but also what covers you don't like. I would say um, oh, that can be. I could go on. Anyway. Yeah. But, um, you know, to, to think about, we prepared a design brief um, with, with my editor for the design team at right. Penguin Random House. Um, I was really worried that the, the cover would end up being a photo of the Eiffel Tower or a French cafe, right. like something that felt really <laughs> cliche and, and that I think ultimately would mislead the reader into thinking this is a book just about Paris. Um, right. And so, but we wanted it to have a French feel, um, but we wanted that French feel to be more subtle than the Eiffel Tower. So we were inspired by French new wave film posters. And um, yeah, so I don't know, it's, it's can kind Sarah of- Sarah Jessica Parker liked it so much that she's photographed with it on the beach. <laughs> that too. <laughs> um, the, there was another cover. I was presented with two options, um, and th- but this was one of the options, and I can barely remember the other one because this one was such a clear winner. We all agreed. We what? played around with the colors and with some of the elements, but um, ultimately it didn't change that much. And um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that there's no like landmark object that screams France. So oh, cool. Um, I think we have time for one, or if we're yeah. very quick, maybe two. Let's was do there... one more. We'll do one more. We won't okay, we'll do one long. more. So here's the last one from Jean. Was there anything you learned from the drafting of this novel that will help you in drafting the next long form thing? Jean, I love it. Um, Jean's a great guy. Hi, Jean. Um, what was I thinking? I don't know. Do you guys, do you have a quick answer to that? Or do you have a good answer to that? I'm, I'm still thinking about it, I think. I think, um, I mean, I, I, this is advice that I had for my first novel, but that I only, I feel like I only really applied halfway through maybe, but what I said earliest, earlier of telling the simplest story, and um, I think uh, a lot of um, younger writers, or, or maybe it's just a problem that I had, um, we, we try to complicate things maybe, or I don't know, maybe complicated is better, but just like, telling it as it is, not worrying too much about that. Um, so that's something that, that I'm trying to apply from the very beginning. And also just writing what comes naturally, like if it's just, if it's not working, then, you know, maybe it's not meant to be, and that's okay. fine. Writing into your strength. I think a pretty harsh thing that I, um, told myself a lot and that I think really helped was mm -hmm. an unfinished novel is not a novel so finish it. <laughs> snap, snap, <laughs> snap, girl. Fuck it yes. Does. <laughs> it's unfortunate but that is the truth. <laughs> God, yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's what I told myself too. It's like put up or shut up time, you know what I mean? It's like if you want to do this you mm -hmm. gotta do it ultimately, you know, and that mm -hmm. means making some hard choices. Yeah, I also, I, it's similar on that note, too. It's like, I definitely get, like, really into some lines I write, and I'm, like, really try really hard to make them work, and sometimes that ends up working out, but sometimes I'm, like, just as might not, might not be this line, might not work here, and so it's, like, just having that sort of confidence to throw away a line and know you're just going to write another good one, where I'm, like, whatever, I'll write a different one, so. Probably yeah. anything, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. And on that note of confidence, yeah. shall we say <laughs> yeah. a big thank you to Powerhouse and Chris. Yes, thank you. And yeah, thank you. you. Take a look at Chris's shirt. He dressed up for the occasion. <laughs> he looks great. <laughs> I can pop on screen. Uh, yeah, thank you so much to all of you, to, to Mega and Jean and Snaim. Uh Thank you to everybody who asked questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, and if you missed the event, we'll have it on YouTube soon. And everybody, uh, buy the books. Uh, we have them all on our website, and they're great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you all truly. so much. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> How do I know? This is that awkward moment you have to leave the Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs>